c'est vrai que ça fait un peu, ça fait un peu. Il y a des petites pièces. Il y a des petites pièces. Si tu t'occupes d'eux, pourquoi Moi, il y a. Il reste un petit. Him. Uh, <laughs> 5 euros par lead, 5 euros. Can you talk to me? Yeah. We will, what we try to do with each purpose, and worship being one of them, is we, we have a way to look at worship corporately for the whole church. And then we have a way to look at worship for a small group of friends or believers. And then we have a way of looking at worship just for one person, as an individual. And for us, it's about taking those five purposes of worship and ministry and evangelism and discipleship and um, fellowship and driving them through each of those levels. So for instance, we would say, uh, corporately, worship exists on the weekend when we come together as a body of believers and worship God through song and, and message. Okay, that's one way of doing it, but we, also, we see worship as more than just a weekend experience, it's a lifestyle experience. It's Romans 12, one and two, it's living every day as a daily sacrifice. But then in order to get that value and permanence of worship um, into every life, we would say, okay, how are you, or how can you, as a small group, worship together on your own? And what does that look like? Does that mean he pulls out a guitar and sings? And he's going, no, that, okay. Or is that maybe they're getting a CD, right? And they're going to a meditative moment, you know, in that. Um, uh, or it might be um, in an offering, okay, but as a small group. And then there are those moments where I would say, okay, well, what am I doing as an individual? How can I worship God? It may be through uh, individual prayer time. It may be through uh, listening to music. It may be going for a walk. Um, to experience God that way, it may be through uh, doing something, right? Kinetically experiencing uh, worship that way. Um, so we try to take the, the concept or the, the theological purpose of worship and drive it from the large group into a small group experience, 
into a, an individual experience. Everything that we do does that. So if you were talking about fellowship, what does fellowship mean for the large body? What does fellowship mean for the small group? What does fellowship mean for the individual? What does missions look like for the large group? That is, for the, as we explained earlier, missions for the large group was let's be the first church to send our people to every nation. We'll take that on as a group or a large group. Well, what does that look like in a small group? It may say that this group here or this group here decides to say our mission is uh, we're going to go and we're going to serve the homeless in Santa Ana or we're going to go down and we're going to, we're going to uh, work with a church in uh, Tijuana, right? Or uh, what does it mean for you personally? It may mean that you personally have to go across, your na- go across and build a relationship with your neighbor so that you can invite him to church or share Christ with him or show up when he has, when there's a moment of what we would call tension or transition in his life. Um, and the reason I say that is because when you study the process of evangelism, most people are more spiritually open to talk about Jesus and the church when they're undergoing some kind of tension or some kind of transition. Okay? There are positive tensions, right? Or positive transitions. Um, when you go from uh, two individuals and you get married, that's <laughs> could be negative trans- <laughs> transition, but for most people they see that as a positive event. Uh, when they give birth to their first child, that's a positive event, but those are moments of transition and all of a sudden when a single guy is now a husband and that single guy who's now a husband all of a sudden becomes a dad, those are deep transitional moments in, the, in their lives. Uh, when is a moment of tension? Okay, well, we have, we have race opportunities all over the world right now where there's conflict between races. There's conflict between factions. Okay, anytime you see that, there is an opportunity for an evangelism there. The, the, the question is, well, okay, how? What is it? What's it gonna be? Show it, you, and you, got, you, you, you move forward in love and you try to figure out what that is. But any anytime there's tension or transition, there's an opportunity to share share Christ or talk about spiritual things. So that goes back to you know worship. We just try to we put it as important for the larger body. We also put it as an important thing in uh, a small group, and then all the way down into the individual life. Courses, worship courses, academy, yeah, uh, when it comes to the creative arts or the, the worship teams, uh, yes, every, every Tuesday night here we have, we have rehearsals and we have opportunities for musicians and those kind of people to come together uh, on that. When the artists, we have, a, we have an art, uh, what is it, a studio? Yeah, we have an art studio uh, in one of our buildings over here where the artists get together and create um, artwork and things like that to, to help with that. Um, and then we will create courses and uh, tools for individuals, yes? I don't know that we have an exact course on worship. I think it's broader than that. But Pastor Rick would say anything that you do is an expression of worship. If you fed the uh, poor or cared for the homeless or uh, loved your neighbor or your enemy, anything like that is an act of worship. Pastor Rick would tell you that it's how your lifestyle is and it's a lot of different elements it's not just about singing that would be an exp- one one way to express it but most people think worship is when I sing it's not necessarily so so I would say in a broader sense Pastor Rick teaches more that it's a lifestyle and if, if, if you tithe that's a sense of worship because you've given to the Lord that um, other people would be able to see your worship by your lifestyle that they would be attracted to who you are and they would say well why is it that you're like that because I have Jesus? So that would be more of a broader sense. I don't think we have a course. Um, not, not yet. We're, uh, we're also working yet. on, yeah, we're also working on, uh, you've heard me talk about our 101 course, which is our Discovering Church membership. Uh, in the book here, Purpose Driven Church, you'll see that. 201 is about discovering spiritual maturity. 301 is about discovering your ministry, your shape for ministry. 
401 is about discovering your life mission and coming soon, uh, not sure exactly when, but there will be a what we call 501 class and that is living, living your life to the glory of God. And the object of that class is to help people get to the place now let's just let's just create a scenario that we're thinking about here and that is if God came to you right now and said I, I want you to give up everything you own and move to Tanzania and serve the serve in a church there could you do that you know him no <laughs> I hope not. That's really weird. If it was. <laughs> but that's the that's the idea that you could answer God's call in in that moment. That you wouldn't you wouldn't be saying, "Oh, but God, I no, I can't do that. I I have a job, and oh, I can't do that, you know, because I have this, or no, I can't do that because I'm not ready." I, well, I've been yeah. The it's the yeah, it's, it's the last part of the come and see to come and die mm. process. And that is, I will go wherever you want, whenever you want, uh, because I love you. And so wherever you want me to go, I, I will go. So that, that's living uh, a lifestyle consistent with Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, living each day as a living sacrifice. Yes? What is the place of affiliation? Uh, on a lot of different levels. Um, there's reconciliation between you and God, right? And that is every time, every time you mess up, okay, let's get right with God. Um, but there's also reconciliation between individuals, and that is that falls under the purpose of fellowship. Uh, for us, when um, when you choose to become a member of Saddleback Church. Uh, we ask you to commit to, uh, I believe it's four things. One, uh, we ask you to protect the unity of our church. Uh, we, uh, we ask you to support the leadership of the church, um, uh, the vision of the church. Now I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of the others. Um, but uh, one of the first commitments that you heard even from Rick today was when you choose to be a member here, um, we're asking you as your primary commitment to love the neighbor next to you, to love the member, the church member next to you. And if there is something between you, then then you have to follow the path of reconciliation. Uh, Matthew 18, um, and there's many other teachings around that. We have, a, we have so. a counseling ministry that you can come and you can get counseling, biblical counseling. So if you have a problem or something that you're struggling with, you can come and get counseling and there will be a counselor that can help you walk through the process of reconciliation. What is it that I need to do to get right with, with God, with myself, and with my neighbor? So we have a process for that, if, you know, to help people learn how to do that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... We do have places where people can do. We also have a Celebrate Recovery program here, which is um, how to help people overcome their hurts, their habits, and, and their, their hang-ups. And, hang and so that's every Friday night here, and you can come, and there's small groups that you can talk about your particular, what you're struggling with. And it's in accountability that you grow. It's in, within accountability with other people that I can change. Um, Pastor Rick says you can't do it by yourself. You have to do it in a community of people. So you have to be accountable and committed to those people to help you grow um, in order to overcome and um, to make right choices or better decisions. That's good. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> I'm the understudy. <laughs> You've been listening. I've been listening to you. I've been listening. I listen to Pastor Rick every weekend. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you too can talk like this. <laughs> I'm also the funny one. Communion maybe once every uh, once every four months, maybe. Yeah. Once every four months. Yeah. Yeah. We. Um, communion. Uh, what, that's a good question. What does communion represent for us? I think it's very different than than what you guys would do. Um, 
Yeah, com communion for us is, is very symbolic of a, a distinct and deeper movement, a distinct and deeper commitment. Mm -hmm. So we have, I would imagine that we will probably do a communion service here as we go through um, our next campaign. We are going to do a, uh, it'll be a giving campaign, but we will study, we will be studying uh, bravery, uh, the character trait of, of bravery. It'll be a, it'll be a series on faith. Um, and we will be asking people to make uh, some significant faith commitments. And um, so we will use communion <coughs> as a, as a way to, uh, to celebrate the commitment and, and uh, uh, well, yeah, I'm just, I, I think they get that. She asked us, how do we use it? Um, so we'll do it as a celebration, as a commemoration uh, moment on some of those. Uh, and that, when we, that's how we'll do it as a large group, but then as small groups, um, uh, some small groups participate in, in communion every small group, every time they meet. Um, so it's, it's very different. It's just very different. During a communion celebration, we will, we will, um, we will pass uh, unleavened bread, uh, generally more like a cracker, uh, and then we will, we will also uh, pass out little, uh, little glasses, little cups with uh, grape juice in it rather than wine. So it's very, it's, it's, it's very different from <laughs> how you would do it. Yeah, a kind of just, oh, just a little, <laughs> just, just a little. I mean, for you guys, it's the main, it's the main, the Eucharist is the main thing. And yeah, whereas uh, with us, it's, it's a bit different. It's a little bit different theology than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I read that you have uh, now churches a bit in other countries. About something, but uh, Rick is the he is the primary rudder of of Saddleback, and so he's it's still very much a strong leadership position. But he has definitely given away a lot of the responsibilities and uh, the decisions to people outside of him. Outside of when we go to different campuses, we're aligned under what I would say are purpose-driven church principles, so that if you see Saddleback San Clemente or you see Saddleback um, Germany, if we have it in Germany, we will have the same DNA. So you will see the picture of Saddleback and how to raise and grow a healthy church. Not You, you can make a church big but not be healthy. So Pastor Rick has principles that we follow and abide by that we believe grows a church, helps people grow in Christ, brings people to Christ, helps them mature in Christ, and helps spread the gospel. So we, we believe in those specific principles on how to make sure that our church is healthy so that we can bring the great commission and the great commandment to the world. I don't know if that's helpful, but... Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And what's going to happen when Rick's going to leave? That's good. I, I don't know yet. <laughs> Well, there there will be something like like that. A saddleback. He said, "Will there be a saddleback conclave?" <laughs> so, um, there'll be something like that. We're we're beginning to talk about it, but um, but it's it, I, there's a moment where you know, even consistent with the Catholic Church, you know, you guys aren't talking about it now, saying who's going to be the next. Pope, right? It's there will be a moment when you go, oh, we need to choose the next pope, um, or there may be a few, there may be a little bit of time prior to his departure or death or whatever it might be, um, where you might have some time to talk about it. We right now are studying uh, all of the all of the uh, leadership transitions that are happening out there right now to say. Uh, one, let's look at one. Let's look at what the Bible teaches us about leadership transitions, 
Uh, two, let's let's watch and see uh, as other churches transition leadership um, and how they do that, and which ones work well and which ones don't work well. Um, let's look at business transitions, which ones work well and which ones. I mean, we're studying all kinds of organizational succession plans to say, okay, when it comes time. Um, so Rick is the one with his staff to set the guidelines how to think about the transition. Um, no, right now, while he's alive, we have the opportunity to talk about it uh -huh. and discuss it. Um, but I don't know that Rick will be choosing his successor. No, but I would say how to choose the procedures. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think I think right now I think we're going to he will be involved in the process to determine what to help determine what that process will be um, uh, because because Rick really has at his heart um, he really cares for the success and the fruitfulness in the 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 future of the local church. And, uh, and he has proven himself time after time after time after time of wanting what's best for the church, not for him. He, he, would, he will sacrifice things on himself in order to make sure that the bride, the body of Christ, is, is lifted and glorified <laughs> properly and appropriately. And, so, and because of that, he is involved in the conversation. If it were otherwise, if we had question about that, he probably wouldn't because he would be so too close to the situation that he couldn't see the damage that he would be doing. It would be like if he came in and said, I want my son to be the pastor, we'd all go, it's not going to happen. If he said that, if he came in and demanded that, we'd say, no, bad process, not going to work. You know. I think we would so. be more like with you, with the, with the Pope, when you select that you, you believe that God ordains that answer and is a part of that process as well. We have what would be, Rick said, as PMT managers. Those people he trusts the leadership to. So if that transition was going to happen, he would trust that those top leaders know the vision of Saddleback. And Rick wouldn't say he wants Saddleback to live on. He would want Purpose Driven to, to, uh, to live on. I think it's both. It, 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 in a sense, but you don't have to be Saddleback to be a Purpose Driven church. If you, wanna, if you read those five principles, you don't have to be a saddleback. But we have a lot of churches who have adopted this model and have grown their church, have great healthy churches, different denominations, different pastors. I think pa Pastor Rick would want that saddleback is a model for a purpose-driven church that, that if you follow these biblical tenets, you can grow a healthy church. It could be a Catholic church. We have some great Catholic friends who have adopted our Catholic, but we have some Jewish friends actually who come and study our purpose driven model because we believe that our purpose driven model serves the community and the Jewish community is very big on how do you serve your community so we've got rabbinical students are coming in a couple weeks actually they come every year to learn how Saddleback um, runs their church to serve the community and care for the sick and how, how do we get the gospel message out now I know that they're not on, on the Christ side of things but they do like how we do church, for lack of a better word. And so they want to know how they can reach their community as well as we have based on these principles. So any church, I think Rick would say he would want any church to grow, no matter what its denomination. Saddleback would just be one of those churches. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, now 